And welcome everyone to join tonight on Open and Forming event tonight. Tonight's topic is Our Lives Matter, Living LGBTQ+. And tonight we will have two story um, tell that to share us um, with share with us their stories and mm -hmm. after this um, story mm -hmm. time we will have show time to have a conversation mm -hmm. and after the second person share a story we have more time to have an overall conversation Great. and Great. tonight's uh, event we will record it for the people who cannot tune in tonight and especially we know last time we have 16, 16 people tuning in oh, and wow. just <laughs> so we just try to let everyone in the church can just be on the same page, right? right? <clears throat> so tonight, uh, our first, uh, our friend to share the story, um, I, I met him <laughs> at CTS 2015, at CTS mm -hmm. my school, Chicago Theological Seminary, and and after that, um, I met him at another school. <laughs> it would have very interesting talk all the time. And he just got all that last week, right? Last week. Oh, wonderful. Very okay. fresh. And <laughs> he might still have a magic right hand and left hand. So we can ask him about that question. <laughs> so let's have a, let's have a warm welcome uh, for our first um, story sharing, Gilbert. Welcome him. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening to you. So I am not necessarily, um, I should know some of you, especially because I am the vice moderator for the CMA. Um, but, you know, we don't get to see everybody in every single meeting, so. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. This is another way I get to interact with folks is when, you know, uh, events happen with congregations. Right. I currently ser serve as designated term pastor at Christ Church, UCC in mm -hmm. Des Plaines. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Sharon mentioned, I was just ordained a little over a week ago. Mm -hmm. And the response I gave him and a congregant yesterday when they asked me, how does it feel? I said, not really much of a difference. Uh, I've been living into my role for several years. So this was just an official type of thing, right? Um, the, the bonus on it is that I get to put Reverend in front of my name now. Uh, yes. So to show for all the hard work that we're put through you know, to get ordained. Um, but you know, when Sharon invited me to speak with you all today, you know, I accept that he's always a very delightful person to be around. And, you know, you, if you, you know, you've encountered him. So most of the time when you encounter him, he just makes you smile even when you're not wanting to smile. Uh, and so I was quick to tell him that I would. So for me, I was raised Roman Catholic and um, I'm originally from Texas, uh, deep South Texas. So where the Rio Grande and the Gulf of Mexico meet. So if you put those things together, you can kind of imagine what my upbringing was or my growing up was. I was adopted and I was raised Roman Catholic to where, you know, it was reiterated several times that I am a man, I'm supposed to marry a woman. And that's essentially the family. And it just, I never understood why it bothered me until I started developing an awareness of self of who I was sexually and this happened my junior year of high school where I began to have a lot of nosebleeds so I went through all these different medical testings and finally my physician asked me he goes is there anything bothering you he's like is there something that you've been thinking about that you just haven't shared with anybody he goes because there's nothing medically wrong with you and so here is this Chicano in this small office with this big, tall doctor in front of him asking him this. And I'm like, uh, and so I said, well, I don't think I'm heterosexual. And he's like, okay. He goes, well, let me send you to a colleague. He goes, you know, you can talk to him about this and what have you. And so I did. And my nosebleed stopped. Mm -hmm. 
So it was the stressor of carrying that with me. Part of the reason I carry it when once again, you know, my dad would give me a ride and I told him recently, actually, <laughs> uh, and I'm in my 40s. So he would drive me to school, you know, when I was in high school until I got my license and would remind me that I'm a man, I'm supposed to marry a woman. Um, and for me, I don't think he was doing it as a vicious thing, but it didn't come out that way, right? I think that when it came down to it, he and my mom had an idea that I was not heterosexual, right? But they weren't going to share that or discuss it until I discussed it. And so I told my dad, I'm like, I know you were trying to be helpful and you were trying to do what you thought was best. I'm like, but you actually, and excuse my language, because I know this is a church setting, but you screwed me up, right? Because mm -hmm. um, my now husband, who we've been together uh, 17, 18 years almost, um, he's dealt with a lot of my growing pains in coming to terms with my sexuality. And so that speaks volumes of him for putting up with a lot of that because we know that sometimes in that journey even when it's a heterosexual couple the partner may not want to stay there while they're doing their growing pains right they might want to leave so I give a lot of props to my husband which is interesting because before my mom passed um, she told me that if it was ever possible for me to marry him that I owed it to him to marry him and this was a hardcore Catholic woman that, you know, had given me these pieces of advice along with my dad. And I was like, wait, what? And I said, no, I'm like, he's just going to have to deal with, you know, a relationship because I'm not going to do the marriage thing. That was still part of me being, having the Catholicism embedded in there and the Chicano-ness, right? Um, but one of the pivotal moments for me was when I was teaching catechism. My sister was an eighth grader at the time, and she was one of my students. And I had to teach my students that it was okay for you not to be heterosexual, but you could not act upon it, as is a usual stance within the Catholic Church. And I turned around that evening and I told the, the director, I am not volunteering for this anymore. I am done today. And she asked me why. She already knew that I was not heterosexual and she knew what my feelings were so she's like okay she goes I hate to see you go over that she goes but I understand um and so it didn't help that I was also an altar server till the day I graduated uh my dad was a Knights of Columbus that if you're not familiar with that it's one of those big religious <laughs> group for men within the Catholic Church my mom was an altar society lady she also taught catechism. So you get the idea there. It was super embedded in there. But as time went on and my mom got worse to, you know, where she passed, I came to the realization that part of my resistance to marrying my husband was my own homophobia that was embedded in there. And many times people, heterosexual people think that as someone who's not heterosexual, that there's no homophobia or transphobia embedded in you. And there is, unfortunately, right? Because it's been put in there so deep that it takes a lot for us to undo this. And, you know, obviously I finally got to that point where I accepted it because I proposed to him on our 10th anniversary of being together, which happens to be the day my mom also died. Um, it's the same day as our anniversary. So it's bittersweet for us. Um, she died at 6.30 in the morning on our ninth anniversary. Um, and I told my husband, if I'm gonna do this, I'm not gonna uh, wanna remember a different date. So we're just getting married on the actual anniversary that we already celebrate. Mm -hmm. So we did. Um, and so we got married a few months before it became national legal. Um, I had never been to Vegas, but I planned our whole trip he had been to Vegas for work uh, for under $1,000, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> I planned their trip. We went to Vegas for about a week. We got married and we came back. And under $1,000, we did everything, right? Um, mm -hmm. His family in particular was upset because we didn't invite them to the wedding. And I told them that it was more about us 
and that I was not about to spend a lot of money to have a lot of other people go with us because we had already been in a relationship for over 10 years. We had a house together already. We had our bills. And for me, it's more important to make sure we pay off bills than to provide an expensive wedding at that point, right? Um, and honestly, when you've been together for that long, it's more of just making it official. Um, so it's been an interesting journey to where when my undergrad, I was taking a sociology of religion course. And my professor, I was the only one open with him about my sexuality. He's like, hey, we're going to be talking about the church and homosexuality next week. So if you don't want to come to class, I'm not going to count it against you. He goes, it's okay if you don't want to come. And I told him, I said, well, why wouldn't I want to come? And, you know, he was like, oh, okay. You know, so when I showed up early to class, there was a fellow classmate on there, Filipino, who was attending a non-denominational congregation. And we started talking a little bit of what the subject was for that day, right? And he's like, yeah, you know, he started talking. He's like, well, in my church, you know, this is what we believe. It's a man and a woman, so forth, so on. I said, well, you do know I'm not heterosexual, right? He goes, no. I said, well, I'm letting you know now I'm not heterosexual. Uh, I said, but I go, anything that you or someone in your church would try to beat down on me, I go, I've been there, done that. I go, I was raised Roman Catholic. <laughs> so um, he, we had dialogue. And by the end of our conversation before class, he's like, he goes, you know, he goes, I had never thought about it from your perspective. So just those few minutes we spent together, it helped him kind of see things slightly different. And when it came to our class session, nothing really happened. There was no offers about, you know, uh, homosexuality or anything. So the class went well. Um, and so before we moved, we were part of a congregation uh, of Disciples of Christ. And in this congregation, it was mainly made up of what we called winter Texans, which are, you know, people from up north who retire in the south because it's cheaper and warmer. <laughs> um, predominantly white congregation, maybe 95% of them were white. And I was going to serve as an intern or a student pastor. And, you know, I asked them, hey, is there a stipend? Because that's around the time that I met sharing. And I started learning about seminary. And a few folks are like, hey, ask to see if they can help you support you through seminary, you know, financially. And I was told there was no money for that, right? And I was never invited to preach while I was there, but I was good enough to teach Sunday school. Um, and when I asked about the ONA process and how come we didn't put a, a flag if we were really ONA, I was told that, well, that's just, you know, showing preference for one community over another. Because then we have to put a Mexican flag or the black flag. And I'm like, what's a black flag, right? I was like, okay. And so, of course, still being from South Texas, I was just like, okay, that kind of makes sense, right? But we had our friends who are same-sex female couple. And they're like, no, that's not okay. And it's around the time Black Lives Matter movement started coming about. And so for me, it was a lot of things, right? And it's like, this is church, this is supposed to help us grow. And this church had claimed to be open and affirming when they really weren't. Because when we moved, they invited another Chicano to come and preach, but they actually started paying him. And one of his first sermons, he preached basically uh, saying, women, you belong in the kitchen, barefoot and pregnant. So <laughs> they mm -hmm. went from not allowing me to preach at all to inviting someone who basically belittled women, right? Wow. And I was just like, well, you know, they, they chose that. Um, so it was just interesting, you know, to have that happen. But I've also encountered places where even when a church does claim like that one, claim to be open and affirming, you mm -hmm. walk in and it's not really, they're not living up into being open and affirming. Or there's times where I'll be invited because of the color of my skin, but not because of my sexuality. And sometimes I'll be invited for my sexuality, but not the color of my skin. And so I served on the UCC Mental Health Network as a board member and vice chair. 
And when we met Andy Lang, who is the one director for a coalition, I asked them, is there a safeguard to ensuring that congregations are living up to that? And one of them is, it's basically the trust system, right? That you're living up to them. I briefly served the congregation for 20 some days that claimed to be open and affirming, but more than half of them didn't understand what that meant. Hmm. And again, for me to say that I served them 20 some days kind of gives you an idea of what I dealt with. Homophobia, xenophobia, um, you name several phobias. That church now has closed because, you know, they continue to shrink and they closed recently. Mm. So when it comes down to it, for me from the pulpit, it's trying to preach and live into trying to make the church as welcoming as possible to everybody and to making sure that it doesn't matter who you are, right? Like my current congregation knows that while I'm serving them, in my capacity, my door is open to any person who is willing to come in and ask me for help or ask me to just sit with them. They don't have to be a believer. They don't have to be Christian. They don't have to be anything. You know, all they go in there is expecting that I'm going to listen to them and share in whatever experience they invite me to share in. So it, it's been an interesting, you know, sort of idea with some congregants, not just my current congregation, but in general, people encounter in ministry, because we often think when the church says, oh, we're very welcoming, and we just let everybody in, well, do you really? Because yes, initially, the rainbow, the ONA process was done because of LGBT, but now it goes beyond that. It is not just our community anymore. It goes way beyond that. And I try to express that to people that it's also for people who, you know, are deaf. How do we allow them to be part of the service? You know, how do we allow a single mom who's always been looked down upon because she never got married and has five different ki five kids from five different fathers? You know, the rainbow beyond the queer community. Where do we go from there? And I think that sometimes as a church we have a hard time expanding our minds and there because we're so used to the same old same old you know square in a sense so i've done quite a bit of talking and i know sharing told me my time limit so i want to honor that <laughs> uh, thank you gilbert for your story and sharing we have a uh we can have a short um feedback or comments that's uh, for uh, Gilbert anything yeah and I'm pretty open so don't worry about <laughs> offending me hmm. well I think that's like a very good that story was very helpful. right very uh, the, the variety and the particular variety, variety of particulars that you get in the I mean, one thinks of the word politics. Uh, I think in our church for like 30 years, we have mostly not cared. It's, you know, no ask, don't ask, don't tell, who cares? That, that, right. That's true. Except not then, but I think also after ONA, we would not right. refuse someone who is bigoted about some particular thing, in particular being homophobic. Right. Uh, at the, so, so there, I mean, when you, all of these great ideals, you, you can find uh, particular situations where they're sort of knock against each other and are, are difficult and don't quite live up to, uh, what, as you said, the uh, range of uh, what it is that you're accepting. And, and in fact, with sexuality, there's such a range of what it is right. that people who are asexual and so on. So, and then on the, uh, looking on the other side uh, of the more positive side in today's Sun-Times advice column, uh, someone wrote in, she says, I'm a mother who's had a daughter who, uh, you know, uh, she, I thought she was a lesbian, whatever, she had friends who were, but then she uh, 
dated some guys, but not for the last five years. And so I finally came to the conclusion she was bisexual. And finally, I confronted her and said, are you bisexual? And she said, <laughs> of course. Well, why didn't you come out to me ever? <clears throat> Do heterosexuals come out? Why should homosexuals come out or bisexuals come out? Yeah. So yeah. I think so that that's a, certainly is a, a progress that uh, right. uh, I, I think would be positive. And for people younger than us, uh, maybe Which is here. most everyone. Well, yeah. but the, I'm saying even <laughs> Gilbert maybe is here already. Well, um, you know, when I initially uh, came out to my mom, uh, mm -hmm. I told her I was bisexual. Right. Yes. And I was very nervous because she was blocking the doorway to my room and I was inside my room. So I didn't have an escape. Um, and it didn't really go the way I thought. Imagine in my head it would be worse. Right. I said, hey, mom, you know, I'm not heterosexual. She's like, OK. I'm like, I'm bisexual. And she's like, oh, no. I was like, oh, my gosh, here it comes. She just, it's one or the other. I was like, wait, what? I was like, <laughs> so she was saying either you're gay or you're not. <laughs> and I was like, um, no, mom, it doesn't quite work that way. I go, I don't know how, and of course, this was pre-internet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and pre-social media. So it's not like if I had resources ready available. I'm like, I'm not sure how to explain it to you, but I don't think it works that way, mom. Right. But it took so many years later to really point at a label for me and what it is, is that I'm pansexual. And it actually took Peter, uh, a younger generation, when I was during my undergrad, they were way younger than me, to explain to me the differences in bisexual, pansexual, and, you know, all of, I was like, they're like, we think you're pansexual, just think about it. And I was like, that makes sense, right? And so that's how, you know, I say that I'm a pansexual, uh, but as most people, I don't like labels, um, right? Because at the end of the day, I'm Gilbert and my sexuality is just a small part of who I am, right? It's not all of who I am. And it, I still have people misidentify me because I'm married to a man, I'm automatically gay. Mm -hmm. And oh. people don't understand how I'm not gay if I'm married to a man. And there are gays who are very involved in a political way in the movement who claim, who deny that you can possibly be other than gay if you're married to a man. Exactly. And shame on you if you think otherwise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't help, right? Um, we still have to work to do, you know, outside of the community and within the community. Um, because until we can on honestly accept everybody for who they are the work's not done mm -hmm. you know and I think that that's where we should allow the church some grace into becoming ONA but at the same time the church has had years and years centuries to get it right and is still working on it and I think at this point there's this much grace and this much push to get them going <laughs> great and I noticed Miles raise your hand. I'm sorry, Weiji. Oh, Miles. I didn't hear. Miles. Oh, he's, he said that he noticed I, I raised my little hand. Here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that either. <laughs> it blended in with that picture frame that's behind you. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, my question uh, for uh, you, Reverend Gilbert, is uh, how did you find the UCC? So you, you mentioned, you know, growing up Catholic and then being connected yeah. to that Disciples of Christ Church, but w where did UCC sort of enter your faith journey? Um, that came because one of the winter Texans, uh, she would just go over there, you know, at, literally just during winter. And she was part of the UCC. And so I was like, what's the UCC? And so the pastor, the sale coffee. he's like, yeah, the pastor is like, well, that's kind of like our sister denomination. And I was like, oh, okay. 
Um, and so that's how I looked it up. And initially, as Sharon shared, I ended up applying to CTS, Chicago Theological. But when I got there, I encountered some of my own stuff that I didn't find suitable for me to be able to grow within my ministry. And it, it kind of derailed my education for me to stay there at CTS. It was not a good fit for me, right? But <clears throat> some of the people I met there, Sharon, for example, <laughs> kind of pulled me into the UCC and really embraced that theology of we welcome everybody and we'll walk with you or we journey with you, right? Um, and two of my colleagues there were involved with um, a congregation which was labeled submission by UCC in this conference, which is now closed. And the pastor was going to have uh, major surgery. So he was going to be out for several weeks. And they're like, hey, would you want to do pulpit supply? I was like, what's pulpit supply? <laughs> I'm like, I'll do it. I just don't know what pulpit supply is. <laughs> and so that was my first time doing a sermon without taking preaching, right? Um, and so Miles, that's how I kind of got involved with the UCC. And every time, honestly, over the last few years where I thought of leaving the UCC, I get pulled back in. Even when I had that 20 plus day experience, I really was going to leave ministry altogether. Um, but I returned to my home church where my uh, former senior pastor nurtured that, right? And we talked and I kept asking, where is God in all of this? And at the end of the, the term, I realized God had been there present within my pastor the whole time. You mm -hmm. know, God oh. had taken the form of this female pastor in front of me who, who was helping me work with this. But it wasn't just about the experience of the hurt that I experienced. It was also, where did I do wrong? so that I could also grow from that experience. And I ended up doing a few things that helped, but yeah, the UCC, you know, it, it's been kind of like, I'm gonna leave the UCC. You know, I went to, a, I graduated from Methodist uh, seminary, Garrett Evangelical. So when I left CTS, some people told me, well, you're taking a step backwards going to the Methodist. And <laughs> yeah. And when I went to Garrett, I felt more at home. Not only did I believe they did a better job of inclusion within ethnicity as well, but theology. They met where I was theologically, and I wasn't pushed to be far left real quick. I was allowed to grow into that. And as a Chicano, as a male, as a former Roman Catholic, and let's face it, as a Texan, <laughs> um, there was a lot of work there. <laughs> so I, I appreciated that, Miles. So, you know, it, it's weird that Garrett, that is a United Methodist Seminary, actually helped me within the UCC. So. Oh, thank you. Oh, the uh, friend also raised the hand. So friend will be the very last question for this section for now. Yeah. Oh. Gilbert, you know that my church, United Church of High Park, we are affiliated with UCC, UMC, PCSA. So yeah. <laughs> it's not big world. We are very progressive. <laughs> <laughs> I primarily just wanted to um, react to something Gilbert said and to emphasize it around the ONA process or bureaucracy, if you want to think mm -hmm. about it. Um, I know of another church uh, here in the Chicago area that they went through the ONA process. And then the next week, one of the congregants said, well, can we take the gay flag down now? We're done. So um, that is definitely one of those pieces. So um, I work, I used to work with young researchers and now work with clinicians. And the same way that I say consent is not a form, it's a process. It's an ongoing process. The same about ONA. And as, as Gilbert also said, or what I want to react to, and I would say a lot of ONA was driven initially by gay men and lesbians, probably even to a lesser extent. Um, and really thinking about the whole LGBTQ plus rainbow, uh, in addition, as Gilbert said, to start thinking about 
what are the other communities that we need to more actively welcome mm -hmm. and how to make our services go That's through right. that. So just what I would say to any church starting a process is you truly are starting a process. And exactly. while there's going to be at some point chuck marks that you're going to mark and be all done with that, um, the growth at its best will continue to happen. So just wanted to throw Thanks. that piece out as well. Thanks for sharing that, Brent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, in Hyde Park, we have 47% white, 26 African-American, 12% Asian, 10% Latino. And there are five other all mixed race. Well, mm -hmm. we have lots of work ahead of us to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gilbert. Stay in tune, you will have the next Q&A time. <laughs> Our second storyteller is my friend. And I met this particular interesting person in 2017 at a very interesting conference called the Reformation Project, if I'm right, 2017. And I just, um, the first day of the conference, I just need to check in. That person just sit in front of the door. It seems that I need to pass a kind of exam to sit inside that conference room. <laughs> this is Miles. I met Miles at that time. And last month, I watched another documentary. Miles is one of the producer. The documentary is on Netflix. That was surprised me. So, so it's a time for Miles to share um, the story with us. That gives Miles a warm welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am so excited to be here. Uh, as uh, Charing said, my name is Miles Markham. I use he, him, or they, them pronouns. Uh, I describe myself uh, as a queer person. Uh, I am a transgender person. Um, trans masculine is a word I would use to describe myself. Um, Non-binary is, is another word I would use and happy to answer any questions about those terms um, after I finish my story. I am mixed race with native Hawaiian, Japanese, Swedish, and some German lineages. And all of those are, are really important to me and something that I spent a lot of time um, trying to learn what it means to embody and to hold uh, at the same time. And uh, I grew up similar to Gilbert in the Deep South, um, but um, between Florida, North Florida, I should be very specific, North Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Um, my family um, could have been described as moderate evangelicals for most of my childhood. And I personally had a, a born again Christian experience um, as a young teenager and became um, ironically more conservative uh, than my parents or, or my extended family. And uh, while the churches I joined and the student ministries I was a part of uh, really did instill in me uh, a love for Jesus and, and for the Bible, they also, unfortunately, uh, instilled in me um, the teaching that any form of uh, gender diversity or, or sexual uh, diversity was uh, sinful, um, that there was uh, something about it that made it uh, broken uh, and God wanted to heal or fix. Uh, at the same time, um, a lot of these churches were also um, pretty conservative when it came to thinking about race, thinking about ethnicity, thinking about uh, the history of the United States. And so there were uh, a lot of, I, I would say, more implicit uh, ways that racism would play out in those communities. Um, and at, as a teenager, I knew or at least kind of sense that the best path forward for me was just to assimilate uh, and to become as much like uh, the leaders um, uh, around me. So 
I did spend about uh, seven and a half years in, um, you know, what could be called like X LGBTQ ministry, X gay ministry, and uh, spending, you know, a lot of time in prayer, um, again, to try and have God fix me. And as you can imagine, um, that did not lead to really life-giving outcomes. I um, went to a Bible college for undergrad, and during that time, um, became severely depressed. I developed a really uh, aggressive anxiety disorder, uh, chronic fatigue. I had an autoimmune <laughs> um, disorder that emerged from that time. And eventually it kind of got to the point where I really didn't want to live my life anymore. And at that point, um, I was desperately searching, you know, for different theologies, different ways to interpret the Bible, anything, you know, that could give me some semblance of hope. And fortunately, um, I did find that. So this was around 2012, 2013. And again, while I was a part of evangelical communities that were not really meaningfully exploring uh, these topics, I, I had enough access to LGBTQ people through uh, Facebook, you know, through um, uh, blogs online for me to know um, that I could be living a different story. And so I started making new friends, started talking to LGBTQ clergy people, and started reading their memoirs and their stories, and it really just um, was a, a kind of born-again experience for me again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I learned uh, not only could I be a Christian and affirm, um, you know, my sexual and gender identities, but I could also be a Christian and fully embrace um, what it meant to be uh, an Asian American, what it meant to be an indigenous person. And uh, it was through finding those kinds of theologies uh, that it started to become possible for me um, to uh, accept myself and, and to really start forming fully affirming and supportive uh, community. And so I, I did have to leave my church. I was kicked out of the housing I had at the time. But um, fortunately, um, because of those relationships I'd already been forming, I had an opportunity uh, to move out of the state and begin working full-time in LGBTQ advocacy. And um, through that work, I was finally, <laughs> I think, able to start kind of peeling back the layers and and finding the right language to talk about gender. And so I'd, I'd come out already um, as queer is the word that I liked. I felt it just kind of encompassed um, the fact of, you know, being drawn to people, not necessarily certain genders. Um, and um, it was actually through uh, different documentaries and different media pieces, film and, and television in particular, uh, that I realized that I, I was transgender. And so I kind of re-came out uh, in, in 2018 and was able to start taking steps um, socially um, as well as medically uh, to affirm my gender identity. And so um, that is probably a whole other story for a different day. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I am now, um, I, I think, sort of in this place where I'm still trying to figure out exactly my faith identity. You know, so I, sometimes I call myself post-evangelical. Um, I, I do describe myself as a Christian, but um, as a person who works full-time for the Presbyterian Church USA, I am not a Presbyterian. Uh, and I have some kind of charismatic, you know, leanings but I would not describe myself as a Pentecostal either. And so I'm, I'm still working that, that part out. But um, yeah, I, I, I like 
what Brent, you shared about the open and affirming process being a process, being a journey. I feel like the same is true with identity development. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm still figuring these things out. I still have questions and I am doing my best to just enjoy the ride while I'm here. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's sort of the big overview. Happy again to answer any specific questions um, anybody has or hear reflections if, if something resonated with you. I do. Yeah, please, Bell. <laughs> you know, this has been such an interesting evening for me and information. Uh, I wish more people in our congregation could listen and hear, you know, these uh, words from you that you've lived. It takes such great strength for you to have, you know, to do this way and all of this. I don't know that much, which Jen has taught me a lot, but, you know, <laughs> as excited I am tonight, it's true, I, I have a long way to go, <laughs> you know, to learn some more. But I think it's wonderful that you are sharing this with us tonight. You know, like me, I had no idea it would be really that difficult. You know, I'm just not that way of, you know, not accepting people for people. But uh, I really thank you so much for in making me more informative also. And I can share that, you know, with my friends. Mm -hmm. So wait and have them back anytime you want, okay? <laughs> Appreciate that. Oh, I, I noticed that Gilbert has a tiny hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Miles, um, I, I don't know what your experience was and maybe you know the experiences, but I know of a colleague who similarly was in a more conservative denomination and moved over to the UCC, right? Um, and part of the growing pains I saw from outside of this person's circle was the push again of like, you're already, you know, out of that conservative uh, denomination. Why aren't you thinking this way already? Did you have anything like that where people were like pushing you mo faster than you were ready to move on? That's a really good question. And nothing immediately comes to mind. But to me, a part of this is because um, my parents were not... Um, what I would, I would say aggressive about their evangelicalism. So for example, um, compared to other friends of mine who grew up in more conservative traditions, I was not um, being uh, mandated to believe any particular set of things. My parents, you know, prayed with us and they brought us to church and they really wanted us to love God and to love other people. But um, there, there was not a lot of dogma uh, involved with it. And so for me, um, I was really captivated by the Jesus story. And that, and that's what I was saying yes to was this person, um, who was a friend, you know, of, of people who've been marginalized, uh, was a caregiver and was celebrating, you know, um, individuals who had been shut out you know, by various institutions. And so for me, um, a lot of, you know, I guess what I would call my own conservatism was specifically like oriented around sexuality and gender. There was like a hyper focus on it. And, and a lot of my like early faith development, for example, was not about hell. You know, it was not about eternity. It was not about fire and brimstone it truly was this like message of like god's love and it's not about what you're denying or saying no to it's what it's the adventure and what you're saying yes you know and and that kind of framing and so um for me i think my kind of deconstruction process I, in that way was much more subtle and it was slow it was over time and um once i started to enter into more um, progressive, um, you know, and, and kind of these radically inclusive communities, 
uh, I did not, I, I guess I was just really open um, to hearing different interpretations and different perspectives, even if, I mean, I have very close friends to this day, very different personalities than me where on paper, like we're in alignment, but they are very much uh, love to antagonize people uh, with their progressivism. And I mean, I guess I, I never felt um, bullied, but I can imagine how that is exactly what a lot of people do experience. Um, and so I'm sensitive to that sort of presentation of progressive ideas, but I was not, uh, yeah, I, I was not victimized uh, by that, fortunately. <laughs> Thank you, Miles, for sharing that. Just had to add, add on again this weekend as I was driving, <clears throat> excuse me, listen to a Nadia Boltz Weber um, podcast if folks yeah. are familiar with her. And it's talking about a very similar circumstance and how can we have grace um, and have these conversations with people with which we might have differences. And it's, it's a challenge, but thank you for doing that. Mm. Yeah, Miles, I have uh, now a question. This is a promotion time. Do you want to introduce about the latest documentary you part of? Sure. On Netflix? Uh, yeah, since you mentioned it, um, I, <laughs> yeah, I was a consulting producer uh, for a documentary on Netflix called Pray Away. It is uh, the history of the ex LGBTQ movement. Um, in the United States, and it profiles uh, sort of the uh, rise and fall of former ex-gay leaders, and it um, also uh, presents the story of a, a survivor of conversion therapy and these kind of ex-LGBTQ uh, types of interventions, and also uh, you're introduced to a current leader, a person uh, who, as of today, is running an ex-LGBTQ ministry that has international reach. Um, this is an organization that is used by um, both the political right, um, but also other sort of uh, movements like trans-exclusionary radical feminists uh, in order to advance um, their own, you know, sort of agendas and talking points. And so, um, this film uh, was something that uh, I contributed a lot on the front end to the research and kind of mapping out of ex-LGBTQ organizations and ideologies and that sort of thing, um, but then became um, a community engagement role. And so I've been working with different churches, seminaries, and community organizations uh, in order uh, to host screenings and uh, community conversations uh, the film has uh, a pretty big emphasis on um, the mental health outcomes of uh, this pseudo psychology um, and, and really um, displays um, just how detrimental and, and death dealing um, these beliefs can be uh, for, for many, many people. So um, that's on Netflix. Again, uh, it's pretty heavy, it's not a light watch. Um, but it is something that I think is, is particularly valuable for people who wonder if conversion therapy is still happening today um, and, and what its effects are. Yeah. Thank you. I watched that documentary though. I cannot finish. Uh, and uh, and the same, same time, I need to watch two times to separate them. I cannot too much. <laughs> any feedback or any comments? Miles, this is partly uh, just curiosity, but also because I don't understand the terminology. You're transgender and you're presenting now as male. Is that where you started and you aren't in female yet or you started as female <laughs> and you're now male? Great question. Um, <laughs> no, I, I was assigned female at birth. And so a, a part of my transition has been the uh, masculinization um, you know, of, of my 
presentation. So yes, um, good question. Uh, many people assume it's the other way around, which is always very funny to me, um, but no, assigned female at birth um, and now trans masculine, non-binary. Um, we could have a whole other conversation another day about what is a man um, and, and how does one know if they're a man? Um, because I, I am still sort of exploring that. Non-binary feels right to me um, because I feel like both, but um, yeah, uh, trans masculine, transgender. <laughs> those, those are both well, words that then, then I wonder if your experience in a, uh, uh, whatever, fundamentalist or um, evangelical faith tradition, yet when you were younger, uh, that it wasn't so judgmental if part of that is because as a girl, that that wasn't part of what you had to do. It's the men who have to go around bullying people. Yeah. And women can exercise the love part. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a really keen sort of insight because that has to be a part of it, right? Like girls and women in those environments are very much socialized uh, to be nurturing, you know, to be kind, to be generous, to be hospitable. Uh, to be open-minded, to be teachable, um, you know, all of, all of these kinds of things. Um, and of course, like being a girl or a woman in those environments uh, is <laughs> no cakewalk. Uh, there are definitely other challenges, um, you know, born of sexism, you know, in those environments. But um, I do think that there, there was, was a kind of comparative gentleness, you know, uh, offered toward me because, because of that. Um, so that is something I've not explicitly thought about before, but I can definitely see that being a mm -hmm. part of the dynamic. Is there any questions also for Gilbert as well? We found a question for Gilbert. It's a good time to rest your tiny hands. <laughs> I want to raise my tiny hand again. <laughs> uh, and, and this can be for Gilbert or anybody else, frankly, on, you know, on this call, we're a small group here. Um, but, you know, my understanding of the UCC is that it's, it's been a, a progressive tradition for a while. Yeah, and the 90s, right? Like there's some kind of big change or the 70s. I, I don't remember the specific history, but a while, we'll say that. Um, I'm wondering, you know, because of some of the things you've shared, Gilbert, um, where does the UCC kind of see its work on this topic right now? Yeah, you know, how does it imagine itself? Is it looking at itself internally, trying to work to really live into that open and affirming position? Or has there been some kind of movement toward advancing a public witness, you know, and, and really kind of resisting sort of the mainstream non-affirming theologies that are so popular and so common, um, yeah, especially when it comes to like mainstream Christianity. Yeah. Well, the, the denomination itself has its stance, right? In, which is supposed to be kind of the general public view of the UCC, which is open and affirming. But because of our polity and autonomy, it allows for each congregation to dictate how they operate. So that's why we have so many, our theology, when it comes down to the local churches, can go literally from far left to far right. It just like in our conference itself, it's that picture. We are left to far right. And so it really is going to depend on like yourself and myself, right? We were raised in the South. So um, it's kind of that similarity. Is that town or is that suburb still within that more right wing? theology. And so that's where this congregation will fall. My congregate, my current congregation is not open and affirming. They don't have any designations of the UCC. 
They're not open and affirming. They're not immigrant welcoming. They're not WISE, which is the mental health, uh, you know, designation. And they've talked about it, but there's still a lot of work that they have to do to get to that point. And, you know, it's having those discussions, right? But obviously they're comfortable enough to have me as pastor Mm -hmm. because every Sunday, my husband is sitting in the front pew with our son and my son has the reign of the sanctuary Mm -hmm. and they don't mind, you know, they adore him. But we can easily go to another UCC congregation in this same area and just basically be shunned. And Mm -hmm. our money would be welcome right? If we give to the collection plate, that goes with any church, right? It's like, you're here, give us to the collection. But people probably would not talk to us, you know, or be like, hi, and that's about it. Very limiting interaction. And so I tell people that that's the beauty and the uniqueness with a little bit of awfulness of the UCC is that our autonomy and polity does allow for that. But it's also a place where if we are to think of each other as siblings, right, as Christian siblings, not all families agree 100% on every topic, right? Mm -hmm. But they can still come to the table and have conversations, have dialogue, healthy dialogue, right? And still walk away at the end of the day, loving each other, even if we disagree. And that's the ideal that I like to think of the UCC is that, yes, we have all these different theologies and political stances, but if at the end of the day, we can walk away away from the table still loving each other, then that makes it worth it. And yes, um, the UCC, like any denomination, has its struggles. My senior pastor that I mentioned earlier, that she's retired, she's actually ordained Presbyterian. Uh, And you would have never known it because she served the UCC congregation for several years. And, you know, she was pretty awesome. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, it's just interesting on how you look at it. I mean, I have a lot of my colleagues are also in the UMC and some of them, their theology is way more progressive than some folks in the UCC. So it just depends. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. I feel UCC decentralization is both a blessing when, <laughs> when you want it and um, but a curse um, at other times as well I I mean for me I, I would put that from you know and Cleveland is where the UCC headquarters is so from Cleveland I mean it I, I feel it's a fairly consistent progressive message um, and it really has been through I think some of these processes right that have come out. Um, to help to give at least some structure for individual congregations to go through and, and to get hopefully closer um, to a unified place, but definitely still work to do. Okay. If it's helpful, uh, a former pastor described United Church of Hyde Park as, uh, tell me if I got this right, Judy. Uh, we worship like Presbyterians, we look like Methodists, and we govern like UCC. Mm-hmm. It's okay, Peter. <laughs> I can appreciate that. Oh, uh, I, it was I can, I can add something. That, oh, this year, Genesis, uh, UCC Genesis, uh, that we have a resolution that uh, UCC is the first in the denomination that ask all level government to ban the conversion therapy and ask all the congregation to work closely with the local lawmakers to mm-hmm. just achieve this goal. So I think it was kind of public witness in, one, in some way. Also, we do not allow us to use the plastic straw at all. <laughs> it's another thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Stephanie, do you have to uh, raise your hand? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. But I was just going to say, definitely, like, it, it, it's interesting to hear both of you ha- have uh, experience in all three of our denominations. Yes. Yeah. Definitely see, say the UCC is the most, um, you know, yep. far left leaning of the three. But it is a lot like the Presbyterian is the 
denomination is the same way in terms of it depends on which church you go to, whether or not they're accepting or not accepting, right? Um, when we were doing our call for our current pastor, you know, we saw all sorts of profiles from, you know, people that said basically like, you know, I want to make sure all my church leaders are in, you know, uh, same sex uh, committed relationships, you know, and I won't accept anybody outside of that to, you know, people very, you know, as, as open as I've seen UCC pastors. Um, the Methodists, I think, I think in Northern Illinois, which is where we are, um, I would say the majority of them are left leaning. They just lack the policy to be able to, and to live in that. Um, but I've got several friends who are Methodist ministers in the Northern Illinois who are gay. And, um, you know, th they've put a um, hold on trials, but, uh, but we, I will also say that um, there was a big trial up at Broadway United Methodist Church probably 20 years ago. And um, our former chair, Ted Swain, was the attorney that represented Rev Reverend Greg Dell. And uh, we've always been, you know, that was back in the 90s. And since then, since that time, we have always been very open. We just have never gone through the process of being open and affirming because two out of three of our denominations at that time did not really allow us. But um, the Presbytery had, has not made as much uh, pr progress as the UCC and the um, the Methodists are stuck in Africa and Asia dominating the policy on it right now. And I think we'll see a split in about the next two years. But I appreciate you guys. I really enjoyed hearing your stories. Uh, kind of work in the background, so I didn't want to turn my video on. But I, I really enjoyed listening to you both. And breaks my heart to hear about, you know, the hard experiences that you've been through. And I'm thankful for you taking the opportunities to just share your, share your experiences with us so that we can learn how to be more open, more, you know, like every time I hear some of the stuff, it makes me more empathetic and more understanding of what people are going through and learn how to um, respond to that in a more caring manner. Cause there are so many times when I don't, you just don't think about how you're responding and how other people might take that. Um, even if you do have good intentions. I mean, I'm not going to say things like, you know, you're going to hell or anything like that, but, you know, just some of those unintentional implicit things that you're raised with that you don't, that you really need to think about how to change your behavior and change how you say things to make things more acceptable for other people. So thank you for your time. I, you know, I actually had, um, when I was talking about all these things, I actually, I was, um, working in a congregation and I had a non-denominational minister. That's how he wanted to be a dress volunteer during our, our weekly meal. And one week he decided that he was not, he was going to show his stance on LGBT ministers. And, you know, I'm a pretty big guy, you know, I'm pretty tall. Uh, compared to some uh, Latinx people in the area, at least. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he, he is uh, Latino and he stood in front of me to block me from people seeing me. And I was like, seriously, like I could literally look down on his head. and I was like, really? Like, this is childish behavior, right? But his stance was that, you know, you know, we're going to burn in hell, basically. And, you know, we have no business serving at the pulpit or a church. Um, and that was a struggle for me to be in, in a church where I was serving <laughs> as, as the pastor at that moment. And to have someone who addresses themselves as a pastor and treat me in such a way. Right. But it was also a reminder <laughs> that no matter where I am, even like, even now I'm ordained, that doesn't stop people from mistreating me, right? Or bashing me with a Bible. Um, and, but it makes it more important to be in conversations like this so that we can continue to have that dialogue and, you know, hopefully reduce that population that behaves in such a foul manner.
Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, any yeah. other comments? I was just going to say, Brent, uh, we talked on the phone two years ago uh, because I was trying to start something like the Coalition for Welcoming Churches oh. in Atlanta. And you gave me great advice and great guidance. I do not live in Atlanta anymore, but um, I wanted to say before we left that it's very nice to see your face because I'm very grateful for what you do. Well, <laughs> and great to see, and I was mild, but then I thought Atlanta, and then you were saying, so yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that, so. Um, no, I want to thank everybody for this discussion as well. I, I guess the one thing it's made me reflect on, and again, my congregation has been ONA for about seven, eight years, and we are really on the journey. Well, and it is a primarily uh, Japanese American congregation, but we are really on a journey looking at whiteness and looking at how that affects the church in so many ways. Um, And I would just say that this work, the work of understanding all of how power um, is distributed in our churches, in in what we do and how we welcome, it's all good work that my, my hope is that eventually that's going to um, take us to the places where we need to be. So um, I want to say congratulations to your church um, for doing this work and really all of these pieces are hopefully going to create better places and and bring the word of God to everyone. So thank you all. Thank you. And, and other questions? <laughs> Oh, today is a special day though. Today is Indigenous People's Day and also National Coming, National Coming Out Day. So today is a busy day for lots of people. So our church is on the journey of coming out, keep coming out. Uh, and yesterday <laughs> yeah. was uh, World Mental Health Day. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's all yeah. coming in there. Yeah. <laughs> So um, thank you for everyone to tune in tonight. And we still have lots of events in November. We have three events in November. <laughs> and the first event will be um, one of our old friends, Frank Schneider. He will oh. come back to share his experience to helping uh, his current church become ONA. And a week later will be his senior minister, uh, UMC or day minister, and uh, the church is UMC or UCC. Okay. And Misa will share with us quite a challenge for um, congregation affiliate to two different dimensions. One of them is not quote unquote open affirming yet and challenging and opportunity. The third event will be our only concert. <laughs> we have a concert, a ukulele orchestra with us. Mm-hmm. So just stay in tune and we will see each other very soon. And thank you again for uh, Gilbert and Miles tonight. Absolutely, it was wonderful. It was <laughs> so informative. <laughs> oh, nice. Can't wait, Jen. Thank, thank you. you. And everyone have a good evening. And especially the thunderstorm. Keep safe. <laughs> yes. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night.